of the Mansion Ferretti Law Firm. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Joe, uh, did you happen to have access to the TV yesterday or whatever streaming device aired the indictments yesterday on President Trump? Uh, yeah, I did uh, catch the news uh, later in the day uh, after dinner about the uh, news of the indictment and actually had a chance to read the indictment this morning. So uh, I'm fairly well versed on at least what's on paper at this point. All right, very good. Before we get into this, I want to set this up uh, in, in three categories, not regarding the, the indictments, but people's reaction to the indictments. And this is based on conversations that I've had with people since the indictments were read yesterday and uh, this morning with the program. Uh, there's the camp that I uh, can't stand Trump. He deserves all of them. I'm sure he's guilty of all of them. Lock him up, throw him away. Let's get rid of the guy. There's the camp that says, listen, I'm, I'm 100% Trump. This is garbage. I don't, I don't believe any of it. Uh, they're out to get him, and they'll do anything to get him. This is just another one of these long examples of Trump investigations that have been going on since he announced he was a candidate. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a bunch of BS. Then there's a third camp that says, listen, the Clintons got away with this stuff. The Bidens are getting away with this stuff. I might not be the biggest Trump fan in the world, but it's not fair they're going after Trump when they let the Clintons blatantly get away with this stuff and the Bidens are blatantly getting away with this stuff. So why should I be bothered if Trump did it too? Those are the three camps of conversations that I've had uh, over the last, what, 12 hours since I was watching the, or 16 hours since I saw the news break yesterday around 5 o'clock uh, or whatever. So as we go through through these, th I just wanted to kind of set that up as the camps that people are in as they listen to this program this morning, uh, Joe. And if you could, let's start to get through these indictments right now uh, as you've read them. Yeah, the, the indictments, uh, really citations to three federal statutes, uh, con conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct a lawful proceeding, and a conspiracy to deny citizens their rights. And, and, and the reference there being the right to vote and to have your vote counted. So those are the three statutes that are underlying this indictment. And then it's 47 pages long. And, and most of the indictment, if you read it, is a factual accounting for how these laws were violated. And uh, it's clear to me in reading the indictment that uh, some people in the Trump administration have talked and will continue to talk to the, uh, the Justice Department and their investigators because there are quotes after quotes stated in this indictment. And you can tell who the quotes are from. Uh, they're from people like Vice President Pence and most likely from other folks high up in the Trump administration who have cooperated. And I'll tell you, Rob, having read this, this really is a 47-page a summary of the work that was done by the January 6th Commission. Uh, and people didn't sit down and read their report because it was over 900 pages. But this is really a summary of the evidence that they uncovered for the most part with one huge exception. Remember that when the January 6th Commission convened and Congress had those hearings, uh, many witnesses who had firsthand knowledge, such as Mike Pence uh, and such as the uh, chief of staff for, for President Trump, refused to answer congressional subpoenas. They did not testify. But with the Department of Justice, they did have to testify and provide information, and they are quoted extensively in this document. Okay, Bill, I'm going to go to you first. Any questions for Joe? Yeah, Joe, I suspect you'll, uh, you'll address in a second, but let me ask the question first. There's been a lot of reference to the undisclosed co-conspirators, uh, but there's been no... There's been no meat attached to that. A couple of questions. What will be the role of these six individuals? What's going to be the impact if they are identified or when they're identified? I think that remains to be determined, Bill. 
My guess is, and, and it's hard for me, uh, I don't have a great uh, criminal law background, but it, so it's hard for me to get into the head of a, of a prosecutor, except to know that oftentimes co-conspirators are listed or identified in a charging document with the intent of having them come forward and save their own skin. And we pretty much know from the information attributed to these co-conspirators who they are. Rudy Giuliani and Jeffrey Clark and uh, Sidney Powell and John Eastman, uh, who were the cadre of attorneys who were advising Trump as to what he could do regarding January 6th and the vice president's role in certifying the election. Uh, they, undoubtedly, they are the co-conspirators, though they're unnamed. And the thought would have to be that perhaps in the face of looming criminal charges that they may face themselves, they'll come forward, cooperate, and try to get leniency from the federal government. Joe, let me stop you just a second. Yeah, you mentioned four, and these are the four that are frequently referenced or or supposed that there there's additional two uh, that's causing a lot more question among the, among the media who these other two might be. Do you have any idea who they might be? Well, I think one has been identified as this Kenneth Cheesebro, uh, who was a um, another advisor to the president. And then the sixth is somebody high up in the president's campaign or elections uh, staff. I, I don't know who that person is. There's been some speculation, but I, I don't have an answer for you on that on that sixth yeah. person. Good enough. Maria. So, Joe, um, without trying to oversimplify things, talk a little bit about what happens now. What are next steps? Um, you know, what happens? Uh, you know, most people understand, I think, what an indictment means, but yet um, perhaps you can elucidate that a little more. Well, uh, unfortunately, we've been down this road before. So yeah. people yeah, yeah, will yeah. recall that once, once there's an indictment, uh, there's a scheduled ar an arraignment where technically the defendant will make an appearance in front of the judge who has jurisdiction over the case, and the indictment will be read, uh, and the an individual who's charged then will have an opportunity to enter a plea, uh, some sort of release or bond will be set, and uh, that's pretty much what, all that will happen. I believe Thursday of this week, has already been selected by the judge for that procedural step. Now, my understanding is in the D.C. Circuit, where this case will be uh, uh, pending, that oftentimes they allow criminal defendants to appear by Zoom and rather than make a personal appearance. Uh, you'll recall that that was not the case in, in New York City, where there was a state indictment, uh, or in Florida. But here, uh, because D.C. Circuit, they do things differently, it's possible that the president, ex-president may appear by Zoom, enter his plea, and uh, I'm sure terms of his release will be decided then. And I'm sure also uh, the defendant in this case will waive the reading of the indictment. Joe. Oh, good, Bill. No, I was going to say, Joe, there's a lot of talk uh, that they need to have, that they would like to have this done, uh, at least the prosecutors, before the election. There's equal amount of talk that uh, President Trump would like to drag this out until after the election. Uh, the uh, prosecuting attorney, uh, uh, Smith, said yesterday he, was, he anticipated a very fast trial. Uh, if, but that's running in direct, uh, not opposition, but in uh, uh, time in, in direct conflict with the one in New York, the one in Florida, and potentially the one in Georgia. So how can you expect to have a fast trial in the face of these other legal proceedings? Well, the irony in all this is that, uh, and I think an indictment's coming in Georgia soon, uh, there's going to be a lot of balls in the air for uh, Ex-President Trump and his legal team, and I, you can bet that they're going to start filing motions in all of these cases, contending that we can't possibly 
be here and be there at the same time. Uh, because of these concurrent cases, uh, we're going to have to have a, a protracted or lengthy scheduling of things. Uh, it's just going to, they're going to argue it's going to be too much for them to handle at one time. So, uh, I, look, the federal system, uh, has a reputation, uh, for, and this is, this is unfortunate, but it has a reputation, at least in criminal matters, uh, to be very deliberate in how they proceed. Uh, I think the country deserves some resolution of these cases so that we at least have an understanding as to the validity of these charges that have been levied against uh, President Trump. And I think that uh, it would serve the country's interest to do that. But I have my doubts that uh, these cases are going to be decided before Election Day, which will be unfortunate. I, I, this judge has a reputation in, in the D.C. circuit of being a no-nonsense judge, being very experienced in litigation matters. She was a former federal public defender. She understands this law. Uh, she's already handled some some January 6th cases against some of the uh, insurrectionists. So she has a background and experience to move a case along. I'm sure she'll probably try. Uh, it's just a question of whether or not all of these cases combined are going to create a situation where it's not possible for a defendant to get a fair shake because of all the balls in the air. Uh, picking up on that point, Joe, uh, is there uh – are there procedures in place uh, that there could be some prioritization of these various trials? In other words, does uh, Jack Smith have the uh, flexibility of saying, I want to charge, I want to go forward with one trial uh, uh, over a couple of other trials? Can that be done? Well, well, I think underlying all this, Bill, is going to be the reality is that you know President Trump right now is the leading uh, candidate from the Republican side for 2024. And it is, as sure as I'm sitting here talking to you, if he is elected president, these federal cases go away. They, they just will stop and they will go away. And Jack Smith will be looking for a job. That is bound to happen if he's elected. So the one thought will be these federal cases have to move so that at least the president gets his day in court without uh, having the power to make these go away. Uh, however, uh, Fannie Willis, who is the uh, state prosecutor here in Georgia, indicated yesterday she doesn't know Jack Smith, has not talked to him, couldn't pick him out of a police lineup, which indicates that at least to this point in time, there's not a lot of cooperation between some of these state charges and some of the federal charges. I think as a matter of necessity, they may have to get their heads together and figure out who's going to go first and, and what's in the best interest of justice. Uh, I hope they do, because, again, we've got a lot on our plate here in terms of I think there's, what, the 79 indictments. Both why in state why and wouldn't federal court. Trump state? Uh, well, because the states don't have to. Uh, bow down to the federal uh, system in terms of federal charges or, or federal courts. Uh, the states do their own thing. But and uh, you would hope there'd be cooperation. Oftentimes there is if there's concurrent state or federal charges. But in this case, these are not all the same charges. Uh, if, if these were same charges, just just charged at a state and federal level, perhaps the federal system would, would, would go first. But the state charges in Georgia are altogether different. Uh, there, there's going to be racketeering charges under state law here in Georgia, altogether different than what's been charged at the federal system. So the state of Georgia can proceed at their at their own pace. And Michigan apparently has uh, some charges they're bringing as well. Joe, I'm not sure if you read yeah. that or not. Uh, against Trump uh, or against I, electors? I believe I thought no, it was against, against Trump. Fake. Do what, Joe? Uh, well, I haven't heard any charges against Trump yet in Michigan, but the fake electors, yeah, the electors. Are, are being charged yeah. right now and being arraigned. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Joe, going back to this, uh, the precedent, uh, I can see how Georgia and New York would be outliers, but Jack Smith has a lot of control, a lot of influence between the uh, January 6th case and the uh, the Florida case. So I think he, if he wanted to shift all the emphasis toward a more favorable sure. judge, he w he could probably do that. Well, here's here's the thing uh, with these two cases that Jack Smith has. The Mar-a-Lago case, remember, there's other people indicted. So now you're dealing with multiple sets of lawyers 
multiple charges, different interests that might exist amongst the defendants. Uh, and the more lawyers involved, the more motions get filed. Uh, I think, you know, commentators have said that it's, it's going to be very unlikely that that case is going to be litigated prior to next year's election. In this particular case, Jack Smith, uh, and maybe another reason why we have uh, unidentified co-conspirators at this point in time, he has streamlined this to one defendant and to three statutory charges. And so I think the intent here is on this case alone to give, at least at the federal level, give it priority and try to proceed to a trial before November 2024. Joe Ferretti is with us via telephone. Joe, one of the defenses that I've heard talked about this morning is uh, there's word that uh, Donald Trump will say, I was just following the advice of counsel. My attorney said this was the course to follow. All I did was follow what they told me to do. Is that a valid defense in this situation? It, it, it's, uh, it is a valid defense uh, to criminal charges to say this was the advice of my counsel that I followed. But the law requires that to be a good faith defense. You cannot, in the face of overwhelming evidence, find one or two attorneys in this country who decide that, no, no, you can go down a different path here, Mr. President, and here's what you can argue and here's what you can say. And the indictment itself lists a whole litany of people and positions counseling this president who, were, who was telling him and who have verified for the federal investigators that they told the president that he lost and that there was no evidence of fraud. And the indictment identifies the vice president, senior leaders of the Justice Department, the director of national intelligence, the Department of Homeland Security's cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency, senior White House attorneys, senior staffers on the president's 2020 re-election campaign, state legislative officials, and state and federal courts who kicked out over 60 lawsuits in November, December, and January. In the face of all that, the president is going to argue that he ignored those folks, the, many of these people who he appointed for those positions to give him counsel and advice, He's going to argue that, no, I listened to Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and John Eastman, and they were the one who was telling me that I had the right to go forth and publicly announce that there was fraud in various states' elections, even though all these other folks were telling him there's no evidence of it. So the argument is going to be, I think, thin soup to argue advice of counsel. Is it also complicated by the fact that the council is also being cited by Jack Smith as co-conspirators? Oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, and and again, I, knowing that Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and John Eastman are on the hot seat here, uh, th- th- that further supports the argument that there was not a good faith belief on the president's part to think that there was evidence of fraud in this election. And remember uh, from the congressional hearing, I think it was Eric Hirschman, who was uh, one of the senior staff attorneys for the president. Uh, He had a phone call with John Eastman, and Eastman was giving him this theory about how they were going to contest what happened in Georgia. And Eric Hirschman told Eastman, I only want to hear two words from your mouth, and that is uh, that we're going to basically have a orderly transition of power. And secondly, I'm going to highly recommend you get yourself a good criminal defense lawyer. Hmm. That was said to John Eastman in January 2020. And here it is today. John Eastman better be getting a good criminal defense lawyer. Joe, let me go back to timing very quick. We've been making a lot to do about this happened before the election. Let's say for the sake of argument that it appears in front of one of these federal courts and the President Trump is found guilty. He is convicted. Now, but he will obviously, uh, or at least I assume, he would uh, uh, 
appeal to the Supreme Court. Where does the, in terms of the election, in terms of timing, uh, does the conviction of the federal court level, uh, is that it? Uh, and the timing and the appeal to the Supreme Court is after the fact? Or is everything, or can the election go forward until the uh, Supreme Court makes their decision? Boy, well, I, a good question, Bill. And I, I, I mean, this is uncharted territory. Can a, can a president who was convicted at the uh, district court level and has a case on appeal, can he still run for office? I believe the answer is yes. Uh, and again, we've, we've actually talked about this on the Friday uh, show with the uh, Gang of Five that uh, uh, we had a presidential candidate run for office from prison. Uh, and if he's got a case on appeal, uh, he certainly will have still rights to a presumption of innocence uh, throughout. So I, I don't see that we're going to stop him, even with a conviction prior to the election, stop him from running for office. Uh, now, but understand this. If he be, is elected president, even on appeal, he can make this go away. Go ahead, Maria. Okay, so um, you you alluded to some of the if he's elected and the federal charges are still there, the the federal charges go away. So you're making some reference, perhaps, to the politics surrounding all this. A um, couple of days back, um, the polls were showing um, Biden and Trump neck and neck, I think 43%, 43%, um, you know, right in line. So what does this do to that? Does it catapult the former president upward? Does it, what, what's your, um, as a pundit, what do you think about that? Well, with every indictment that has come down so far for, uh, Donald Trump, uh, his fundraising has gone up. No, no, that's not right, so, Joe. That's not right. Just the opposite. The first one he got the maximum amount of money. Each subsequent indictment, he's gotten less amount of money, uh, and we're going to be curious what he does with this indictment. Oh, really? I, yeah, I, I, yeah, that surprises me, Bill. Because no, uh, I, I think, look, I'll, I won't be surprised if he raises. In fact, he's already online raising money uh, for this, and uh, you know, I hope donors understand that the money's going to his legal fund. Uh, it's not going to his campaign. Uh, I'm sure he's spending some money on his campaign because he's making personal appearances uh, as late as uh, just a few days ago up in Erie, Pennsylvania. But uh, filings that have just been made regarding expenditures for the last quarter show that much of this money is going towards his legal bills, uh, tens of millions of dollars. And I, I, I don't doubt that there are people right now writing checks to him in the face of this indictment. Oh, uh, undoubtedly they are. And I'm going to give some numbers, Joe, and I, I'm, I'm fuzzing on the numbers. I may be off an order of magnitude. But after the first indictment, something like $10 million he was able to raise. At the second indictment, it was reduced to around $6 million. And then a third one, around $3 million. So there is a, and it may be off an order of magnitude, but there is a trend that less and less money. Now, this indictment may reverse it. We don't know yet. But there is, but the some. The there's some concern in the Trump camp that the indictment argument is worn thin. Well, and we talked about money, but what about approval? Who 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 stands to gain here? The former president, the current president. Well, that's that's well, a different story. I, I think if you if you've read some of the recent articles, editorials in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Business Insider, uh, some commentators, even on on Fox. Uh, and I, I was watching Fox last night. Look, there, there's quite a few Republicans who think he is unelectable. He has a, over 60 percent unfavorable rating overall with the electorate in this country. So I think it's a legitimate question to ask, uh, regardless of who's on the Democratic side. And, and it remains to be seen if that's going to be Joe Biden. Uh, it, it's going to be fair to ask, is he electable at this point? And, and I, I, I'm. I'm warning folks because I keep hearing about what's going on here in Georgia. What's coming down the pike there uh, is going to be just as troubling for him, I think, in terms of the nationwide reaction to what's happening. The uh, One of the fundraisers, by the way, the Trump camp apparently is now selling T-shirts marking the indictment date for $47. So if you'd like a $47 T-shirt, <laughs> that money goes to his legal defense fund, too. 
Uh, you got, you got to love America. <laughs> you know, there, there you are. That's that's America 2023 right there, baby. Hey, Joe, thank you. Appreciate your extensive uh, information on this. Uh, we uh, will talk to you on Friday, okay? Okay, look forward to it. Thanks. Okay, Joe. Bye. Joe Ferretti at 933 segment broadcast.